Hello, Music City, and welcome to Nashville Restaurant Radio. It is a Monday. Here we go. Rainy Mondays. Got to, got to love them. Today, we are coming to you with two of my favorite people in the city, Chad and Gracie from East Side Bond Me. They tell their love story. They talk about their past. They talk about their future. And uh, what bothers them the most in the restaurant working together? I tried to get them to come up with a safe word, but uh, you'll have to listen to see how that ends up. Today, we are, uh, we're we're going to be having a fantastic on-brand today from Complete Health Partners. And they are going to be talking to you just kind of like how it works, because it almost seems too good to be true. These guys are doing amazing things for you. We're going to jump in with Christian Rupp in just a second. But I want to ask you out there, I don't do the best job. I listen to my kids watching YouTubers all the time saying, smash that subscribe button and tell everybody about it and give me likes and all these things. But um, I ask sometimes, but I'm going to ask again. I uh, really want to build this thing up, guys. I keep getting wonderful feedback from you. Thank you. Um, just tell me that you like the show. You like listening to it. You like hearing these stories. So let other people know. I love word of mouth. Let somebody else know that you love this podcast. It would mean the world to me. Also, subscribe to it. Whatever way you're listening to it, subscribe to it. Go to our YouTube channel if you're watching this right now. Thank you. But click the subscribe button that you're watching it on right now. And if you haven't been to the YouTube channel, go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, I would love to know how many people out there are listening and watching all of this good stuff. So with that being said, uh, let's jump in. Let's check in with Christian Ruff right now. And now we're excited to welcome back to Nashville Restaurant Radio, Christian Ruff, who is the Chief of Staff for Complete Health Partners. What's going on, Christian? Hey, good morning. How you doing? I'm fantastic. I, the more I learn about what you guys do, the more excited I get. And I was thinking the other day, that businesses start off with a reason. They start off with a, hey, here's a problem. I'd like to solve it. And you guys really hit on that. Like, how did that happen? So about six months ago, I was transitioning out of the military where I'd spent the last 10 years as a pilot. And I picked up a internship at Nikki's Coal Fired. I was looking to get some hospitality indus industry experience because my wife's family they're all in restaurants i knew i was going into healthcare, and i was like you know what i just want to go learn how to make bagels so i started i guess that was eight months ago now started making bagels with nikki's um as my transition completed and i found myself with complete health partners which is a locally owned primary urgent care practice with three locations here in nashville i kind of pieced together the two in seeing not just at Nikki's, but across the board restaurants, there was a large gap in the direct health care that could be provided to its employees. I saw it with um, restaurants that are owned and operated by my in-laws, other restaurants here in town. And I just saw this gap of like, there surely must be a way that we can provide direct care within our community um, that, that doesn't have to be expensive premiums and deductibles and co-pays that traditional insurance plans offer. Um, so that's kind of how it all started. So for me to paraphrase that, you are in healthcare with complete health partners. You pick up a job. You want to you expand your horizons. You're working at Nikki's and you recognize there that restaurants and small businesses have a hard time providing major medical. And you guys provide urgent care uh, local urgent care with a local company, and you can offer that to restaurants at a fraction of the price of major medical. Urgent care and primary care. So the, there's a couple options that we're offering, and we're seeing that like there is a there's definitely a need for direct urgent care. A vir think of it a virtual on-site clinic. You have an employee at work, he or she gets hurt, they need to be seen. Do they go to the ER? Do they go to the urgent care? Or can they wait until they can schedule an appointment with the doctor? Well, we bridge that gap by telehealth. Hey, come into us right now. So the employee comes in, we bandage them up, whatever it is, get them back to work. It's not the, oh, they need to go to ER for something that can just be solved like 15 minutes down the road and a 45 minute uh, throughput time. On the other yeah. side, we find that having a primary care doctor is not a lot of people have that they don't have a direct relationship so we're offering hey you're going to come in we're going to assign you a primary care doctor you're going to have his or her email address and anything that comes up 
you're just going to email them or you're going to call them. You're going to get an appointment. There's no two, three week wait, no copay, all locally operated and at a fraction of the cost. No deductibles, no copays, just a simple monthly subscription. So that monthly subscription that you charge to restaurants. So if I own a restaurant, right, mm -hmm. and I want to offer my entire staff primary care and urgent care um, and telehealth, how do I begin? What do I need to do to get that going? Uh, the first thing is just reach out to us. And uh, the best way to reach us is at complete care at completehealthpartners.com. And there's a couple of different options that we're offering, all starting at $50 a month for either the urgent or the primary care. Um, and then a combo of the two, and we can just assess your needs and figure out what what is the best solution. So there's no, it, it hurts me nothing to go pull up my computer and email to complete care at completehealthpartners.com. And I just send you an email that says, hey, I'm with a restaurant. I heard you on Nashville Restaurant Radio, and I'd like to learn more. Yes, Sign John Q. Restaurant Owner. Yeah, and you know, we started with restaurants just because of the immediate exposure and experience that I had when I saw this gap, but really it, it applies to all businesses. I mean, we have our own employees that are enrolling in this because it doesn't necessarily replace or is an alternative to health insurance, but it gives you that direct access that those plans cannot offer. So we have people within our own community asking for it. Well, this is a tough time to get employees to come work for you and to offer benefits to them is a huge draw. And I think that you guys have absolutely solved a problem. And it's fun for me hosting this show to have you guys on for me to be able to introduce this to restaurants. Like, I feel like I get to tell you guys about this amazing opportunity in front of you. It's local, you're supporting local, and you're offering an amazing benefit to your staff. Christian Ruff. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, and thank um, I will, I will, hopefully you will get many, many people emailing you and hopefully we can help um, restaurants in Nashville offer this healthcare op option to their staff. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christian. Have a great day. All right. Thank you so much, Christian, for taking the time to talk to us here today. Your sponsorship means everything. I love that you guys are getting involved. Let's get on with the show, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Gracie Nguyen and Chad Newton. Super excited today to welcome in Gracie and Chad. Uh, they are the owners of Eastside Bon Me. Welcome to Nashville Restaurant Radio. Thank you so much. Hello. What's up? It's so different seeing you guys like not in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. It's very nice to not be in the weeds uh, at the moment. At the moment, so I will tell people out there that this is this has been an interview that I've wanted to do for like so long, but getting you two standing still long enough together to talk is not always the easiest thing. What does your schedule look like right now? Well, yeah, we're, we're pretty pretty darn busy. We always we have been since we opened uh, last August ish. So yeah, it's been a it's been a jam nonstop. It's only it's, it's going to be a year soon. I just can't believe that it's just flying by. Um, but our schedule right now is the restaurant's open six days, and we're pretty much there six days. Um, we close early on Saturdays and just do lunch, and then our one day of rest is Sundays. And uh, we kind of always planned it that way and intentionally for a few reasons. One, uh, we wanted to have one guaranteed day of rest. Sure. Um, I'm also a big football fan, so it kind of goes hand in hand with that too, to have like a nice lazy Sunday watching either football or the English Premier League, my two my two things. And Gracie loves to have her little rest and quiet time on Sundays as well. But also, you know, we wanted to make sure we had a, a day closed where we could do some cool events and pop-ups at the restaurant when we wanted to. So that's Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So who's your favorite football team? Uh, I'm American football. Niners, Niners fan all the way. Born and raised in the Bay, and yeah. So okay, yeah, Gracie. What, what do you typically do uh, if he's watching football and, and football, and uh, you get the one day off to relax? What do, What do you do to relax? Well, um, this is gonna be embarrassing, but I don't get out of bed and I'm on my phone watching TikTok and Instagram all day. <laughs> Dude, seriously, is in, is is uh, TikTok not the most addictive thing yes. in the world? It's awesome. You know what? I've learned so much <laughs> on TikTok too. People think it's like for teenage girls, and I am a 42-year-old man, and I 
I love it. I keep texting my wife's like, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, you, I keep texting her these videos and she's like, that's hilarious. I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's very, some good, very fun. There's some good content there for sure. I haven't gotten into it luckily. So, you know. So, okay. So you lay in bed, you chill, you play on the internet and uh, that's, that's, that's totally acceptable. I am completely down for that. Um, where did you guys, let, let's get back into some of your, let's start with some of your history. Um, yeah. You guys are a married couple. How long have you been married for? Um, this August will be 10 years. Wow. Wow. What day in August is your anniversary? Just curiously. Uh, August 7th. August 7th. All right. And what day did you guys open the restaurant? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry? What day did you guys open the restaurant? What was it? Oh. August uh, August 17th? Or yeah. August 17th. I, didn't, I was just randomly like, did you guys correlate that to like open the restaurant on your anniversary so that you could have this day? And mm -hmm. no. No, I, I don't even think we were thinking about yeah. the anniversary. I think we kind of uh, uh, skipped over that this year by half by accident and half because we were just so busy with trying to get a restaurant open in the middle of COVID. But yeah, um, yeah. but thank you know we did that a little quick interview with you on our opening day, which was so cool. So we appreciate that. We were so probably uh, uh, nuts at the time and probably not all there, but it was really cool to do that quick uh, spot with you. I will give that a little bit of a plug. If you go back on um, Nashville, we did a show called the Music City Roundup, which I'm going to bring back. Uh, it was a weekly show, probably going to be a bi-weekly show. We just talked about all the cool stuff that's going on. And when you guys opened, it was major news, man. It was, we've got the owners of Eastside Bond Me, and you guys came on and gave us a, yeah, we're opening today. We're kind of slammed. But if you want to hear that interview, go back on the on the subscription, look back on August around that August 17th time, and you think it's August 17th, you'll find the actual interview with them. So go back and check that out. Now, you guys are both from the West Coast, right? Well, Gracie's originally from Texas, but... Yeah, I um, moved to uh, San Francisco to go to culinary school at like 20, 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Chad, did you go to culinary school? I didn't. I went to, I got a degree in restaurant management at San Francisco State, um, but we kind of both went through the school of hard knocks actually in really good restaurants, which is what we recommend to everyone, of course. But um, yeah, so that was my culinary school was just cooking at the best restaurants. So Gracie grew up in Houston with your grandmother cooking, teaching you classic Vietnamese. You went to uh, San Francisco to go to culinary school. When you graduated culinary school, tell me about your experience working in restaurants and kind of what that was like. From the from the perspective of I just got a culinary degree, what were people? Did you walk in and say I have a culinary degree, and be like, oh great, here's your executive chef job? Or were no, they like, oh no. great, go wash dishes? Yeah, I actually uh, while I was in school, I was working for the Wolfgang Puck Cafe in Macy's, which is not there anymore. Um, but going to culinary school and with and eating around, my favorite restaurant was Postrio by Wolfgang Puck, is like a fine dining. And so after I graduated, I was like, I want to work for here. And so I did and stuck around for a long time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What about you, Chad? You said you graduated with restaurant management. So you're both restaurant people. I mean, this is right. something you guys both decided you were going to do. Restaurant management degree. Where did you go work? What was your experience like? Well, you know, going back, one of my first jobs in high school was at Domino's Pizza. You know, like I just always loved to eat. That was my thing. Like I could Pizza Hut. Yeah, you know, like I cook because I love to eat, as you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so like going back to that, and then in college, um, I worked. Uh, I went to San Diego State as well for four years, and uh, had a great, too much fun down there, and really couldn't progress down there in the business school. So kind of went into the restaurant uh, area, and um, I was working at some chain restaurants like Pizzeria Uno back in the day. But I became yeah, a, yeah it was actually pretty good stuff back then before I got super over commercialized, but. Um, you know, was becoming a trainer there and doing that. And then I moved to San Francisco, started um, going to San Francisco State in the restaurant program. And at the same time, I started, I got offered a job at Postrio, which, you know, where Gracie and I uh, eventually met, which was one of the best restaurants in San Francisco for many, many years. It was a fantastic place. A lot of great chefs came out of there and um, super great pedigree uh, about it all. And it was just, it was amazing, amazing place. So that's where I, kind of got in there as a, a front of the house food runner and expediter. And then eventually I started, uh, so I was doing doubles on that. I was working lunch and dinner 
going to school. And then also sometimes in the middle, I would, on the weekends, I would jump into the kitchen and help out. And then I started working my way up and uh, about a year and a half later, I became sous chef and did a really fast track there in the kitchen. So if you're listening to this out there, th this is this is the roadmap. Right. This is the, with, with what we're discussing here, this is kind of the restaurant roadmap, the, that school of hard knocks, like yeah. they said. I mean, you get in there and you put in six, seven days a week. You hustle. This is why a lot of people are turned off by the industry. But then also, I think that's why a lot of people are turned on by the industry yeah. because people that need to get out there and just need to serve and need to work like this is this is an absolute like welcome. Come on in and do it. You guys both seem to be right there with that. Well, I'm glad you said that because um, however stressful it was, it was also so much fun. But then for me personally, it was about the pure joy of delivering beautiful food to a table of people having a great time and them just utterly loving it. You know, that was it for me. Like that sold me, you know, I'm delivering these beautiful plates and putting them down in front of people and they're having this great time and they're looking at their food going, wow, this looks amazing. And I knew the food was quality and beautifully presented and there's everything about it was just such a turn on and plus you know the camaraderie and and restaurants at that point were you know just over the top it was just such a great atmosphere for all the other toxic things that go with it <laughs> yeah. you know there was so many great things and, and that's one of those things where kind of the the great things uh, but i do i always still break it down to basically the act of hospitality it really comes down to that and everything you do you know that's what hundred percent. I hear you tell that story and it's almost like the, the kidnappee falling in love with the kidnapper. <laughs> <laughs> Listen right. to this and I'm like, yeah, it was, it's, it's a lot of hours. It's really hard, but eventually we all fell in love and it was a fun deal. And you guys literally fell in love there. I think we touched on this on the interview last time, but let's, let's just let our listeners know again, you're both working at, um, the, Say the name of the Wilking. I, I want to say Pastoria because that's what we had. Poster, post post trio, and it was post -trio. on Post Street, and there was three owners, so it was Post Trio, and yeah, it was a very classic Wilking Puck. Got Puck it. Restaurant in San Francisco. I'm I'm not as up to date on the San Francisco food scene and all of the restaurants as I should be. That's why we talked to people. You guys let us know. Gracie, what did you think the first time that you? When did you know like that you kind of liked? chad did he ask you out were you guys like out having drinks like what was the first time you saw him that you were kind of like hey that, that guy could be you know he's kind of cute or whatever um so we uh i left Postrio to work at the Postrio in las vegas and then i came back to san francisco years later and that's when we ran into each other and uh i didn't really recognize him because you know 10 years later he's changed a little bit and, um, but he actually had a girlfriend at that time. So I didn't really think of anything. Um, and, but I think we started hanging out as friends for a bit and then, you know, things happen. Well, I think she's being nice about it. The whole, the real story is that. There we go. Yeah. It was that I was a food runner. Um, so I was working more in the front of the house or the middle of the house, if you will. And Gracie was cooking on the line in a, in a kind of very hardcore male dominate, dominated high aggression, like old school classic line. And she was fighting for herself back there working the grill. And this is like one of the most hardcore grills you will ever see. You're grilling squab, quail, like tons of chickens, tons of steaks every night, like over this open fire. And it was just a hardcore station because I eventually worked it. Um, but, um, so I just remember, you know, bringing her plates and doing things like that. And she claims that she doesn't remember me at all from those days. And so that's where kind of the fun story comes in is that she, I guess I wasn't that memorable. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we kind of, you know, Grace, you moved on to go to um, Post Rio Las Vegas and open that. Um, I traveled around a little bit. We both came back to San Francisco separately and started working as executive chefs at different restaurants. And um, I remember I went to her restaurant, which was the Slanted Door at the time, which is, you know, an awesome restaurant in San Francisco, one of the biggest and high gross, highest grossing restaurants actually in the country, um, but really amazing Vietnamese food at the Ferry Building, uh, which is a complete culinary destination there. Um, but I went in with my dad and we were popping around, going to different restaurants, just tasting food before a Giants game. And I remember seeing her in a chefware catalog, because that's where you bought 
stuff back in the day. It was like literally the chefware catalog and the newspaper to find cooking jobs, right? That was really what it was then. All all the kids out there right now, (laughs) you would like circle a job on the thing that you were interested in, or you would circle the chef coat that you liked, and then you would order it, send a check-in or whatever it was. (laughs) Um, but she was in there as like a chef or a model. And I remember seeing her and going like, oh, I remember her from, from Post Trio. And then I went in and I asked, because I had heard she was working there or saw her in the kitchen or something. And I asked to see her and like very nervously she came over and like still didn't really remember me, I don't think. And um, that's kind of how it started. And then we did, we ended up doing an event where we were both there, you know, doing tastes or bites. And um, we kind of started talking and started texting and then started hanging out a little bit. And then, what, like a month later, we moved in together. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That that, that escalated fast. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of knew it was a, we kind of knew it was a fit. That's amazing. I I don't know. I I saw you the other day. We were at at Gifford's Bacon over there at Prime South Meats. And you're just... Every time I see you, Gracie, you got your head down and you're just hustling. Every time I see you in the kitchen, wherever it is, you're just working, like literally head down working. I just picture you at uh, post post trio, and I just see you on the grill. Were you like a were you like a badass? Were you like one of those people that was just there and just like yelling and cussing, or were you, were you just like in your zone, doing your thing, not saying a word? What kind of what kind of person were you on the on the line? Well, definitely just in my zone, but I um, just working hard because it was I was pretty much the only female on that cooking line, and it was hard to deal with like the males and the way they talked mm-hmm. and all of that. So I just put my head down because I really loved what I did, and I just put my head down and just try to do my best. That was it. I hear that, and I and there's a side of me. You know that I read Anthony Bourdain Kitchen Confidential, and you know that was just kind of a rite of passage. Guys in kitchens being guys, but like that's so terrible. I, I think about that now, and I think how like what an incredibly terrible thing that must have been. Like, did you did you did you like get done with the day and have to like go talk to somebody about some of the stuff that you heard, or did you were you able just to fully put it aside, or did it like bother you? Because I mean, it what? should. Yeah, it didn't really bother me. And it wasn't as bad as like some of the things I've heard. But um, I don't think it really affected me because, you know, like I'm I'm at at work with the kids now. I would tell them stories and we can just laugh about it. But it wasn't, it didn't really bother me at all. What about you, Chad? When you got back there on the line, are you, I I like to talk. Like I'm a, imagine that. Like if I'm back there, I like to go like, Hey, you work in this, you got this, you got this. Even at Expo, I like to have I like to have like chatter back and forth. Yeah, chatter's important. I, I think chatter's important, but I mean chatter's different now. You can't run kitchens the way that we used to and people used to. And you know, I've worked some for some really hardcore chefs where, you know, it was borderline abuse, like mentally and sometimes physically. I would get thrown off a station physically, things like that. And you know, once I went through that, um, I started running my own kitchens and there was a little piece of me that, that I had of that and I took with me. And I was a little bit of a yeller for like a year after that. And then I just realized, I was like, you know, this is not the right way to go. And this is, you know, 15 years ago, but you know, or, or, or 10 years ago. And I just started to realize as we started kind of, um, developing restaurants and doing our own restaurants with you know, partners and such, we just started to realize that you just can't do that anymore. It has to be a better environment. And I'm glad things have changed so much where the environments are way better than they used to be. The toxicity is down. Again, it depends on where you're at or, and who you're cooking for and kind sure. of the degree of that chef or restaurateur is because there's, there's definitely still some places that don't have the best work environment. But at the end of the day, it's like, why? You know, let's just make it easier for all of us. It's such a hard thing in the first place. Why would we make it harder by having just a tougher environment? Yeah. I think it's almost impossible now to have yes. that type of, I mean, that type of environment with the labor shortage and people just go, I'm not putting up with this. Like I'm out, like I'm not doing this. But then again, I guess if you're, if you're staging for somebody and you want to be in that role and you want to learn from them and people can mentor, but I think that's, a, it's just, it's just going by the wayside. Thank God. Yeah. Business has changed completely. And that includes the restaurant business. Um, as kind of ages cycle through and, and whatnot. So um, it's good to see. I think that there's a lot of chefs out there that are really kind of um, 
even taking that and running with it in the opposite direction of kind of how they came up um, and really kind of integrating a lot of really cool things into the workplace and the culture um, that makes it just a lot easier for everybody and a lot better for everyone mentally, physically, all that. So I'm glad it's gone that direction. Well, you guys are doing a great job with that. Every time I see you, you're like the happiest person mm -hmm. that I like. Is that intentional? I mean, are you? Because I mean, every time I see you, man, you're just always big smiles. You're just happy. And like, I love your energy. Both of you, like, just your energy. When I walk into the restaurant, it can, it can feel it like it's palpable. Is wow. that intentional? I mean, do you want, yeah. I mean, is that what you're trying? Is that what you're going for? Or is that just naturally what happens? I think um, hospitality is important. So, you know, saying hello, saying goodbye, saying thank you to as many people as you can. Yeah, you miss a couple of people because you're busy too and you got your head down looking at a sandwich or looking at tickets or trying to direct or trying to look at a, you know, a transaction on the register. But our biggest goal is to really try to engage with every single person that comes to the door. And I think we're pretty good at it. We can always be better. And that's always the goal to try to catch as many people as we can. That's why oftentimes when you, when you come into Eastside Bombing, you'll hear two or three people be like, hey, how's it going? You know, hello. We just try to make sure we're doing that and talking to people. And I think that's just the basic hospitality. And yeah, for the most part, we're having a really great time. We're having so much fun. And I think that's the best comment we've gotten from a lot of folks around Nashville, uh, specifically a lot of our peers is just like, seems like you guys are having so much fun. And that's what we're trying to do, honestly, especially in these such tough times. Um, we're kind of uh, reinvigorated in the business. We went through some really tough times back at some of our, our previous businesses. And this is a, you know, a brand new change for us and a, and a brand new opportunity to kind of do our own thing really just as a family business. It's just Gracie and I and a great team, but we don't have any partners or investors. For the first time, this is really our own kind of family thing where we can make every decision ourselves and do everything we want to do. And so the idea is I think that really makes us happier and, and have a better environment and a better culture. And again, it, it to me, it really just comes down to hospitality and um, Gracie is kind of the same way. It's so funny when people always say like, oh, you always hide Grace here or something like that. <laughs> she's just so busy in the kitchen, like running the kitchen well. And I have to be that person that's really try to be really engaging in the front and talk to people and, and, you know, just spend as much time as I can doing that, but also hoping in other areas. So I think we balance each other really well. And that's why I think, um, you know, after so many years working together, we've kind of finally figured it out. Mm -hmm. And believe me, that doesn't mean there's not tough times or hard times. Of course, there sure. are. it's running a business together. And, um, you know, we've done this for a while. And in the beginning, it was really hard. The first two years of being married and also, you know, running and operating businesses together was brutal i mean yeah. like we didn't make it almost didn't make it a few times you know what were the first 10 years like or the first nine years what well, were you guys doing? you said you had partners did you have other restaurants that you yeah so just a quick background so it would take too long to talk about it all but uh there was a moment in san francisco where grace and i were you know uh executive chefs at different restaurants and we kind of crossed over and helped each other a little bit at each other's restaurants just based off of our availability and stuff uh, so that was great. That's when we first started working together a little bit. Um, and then obviously like cooking at home and stuff, it just was like a common thing for us just to cook together. And we totally clicked when we did that. And it was so great. Um, and then in 2011, we moved from San Francisco down the peninsula to the uh, Silicon Valley area, Palo Alto, Menlo Park. And we created and opened up a, a first restaurant that would become 10. Uh, that we fully developed with our old partner, Frank. Um, it was called Asian Box, and it was a fast, casual Vietnamese, um, really cool concept that still has eight locations open today. And we remain great friends with all of them, all the investors, all the partners, uh, the current CEO, um, the board of directors, everyone involved, a ton of the, the staff still at all the different stores. But we created that from the ground up, uh, Frank, Gracie, and I, um, opened one up, it was a smashing success in Palo Alto. It's right across the street from Stanford University. A uh, tiny little store, 913 square feet. It was basically based off of Vietnamese rice and noodle bowls um, that was served in a box. It was called Asian Box. But um, we grew that to 10 units. So we went through all of that all together, growing a company into that many units. And we learned so much from it, um, good things and bad things, of course. And like I said, I'm still proud that we're 
um, still great friends and family with the with with the um, the restaurant group, and you know we still retain some equity, and you know everything's great, and we wish them the best as they continue to 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 rock it out in California. They only lost two units during COVID, which is which is crazy. Um, they done really wow. well. So, um, so what about that, you in Nashville? Yeah, sorry. Go. What, what brought you to Nashville? Oh, that's an interesting. Why Nashville? Yeah. Well, um, kind of being in that and going through that growth and and experiencing what we experienced was somewhat of a factor. We, it was kind of like that um, timepiece that you're kind of ready to try something else. And then I had a little tragedy. My mom passed away suddenly in uh, 2018. And that kind of just changed me completely, like completely. And we just needed to change. And um, it all pointed to trying somewhere new uh, to be. And we looked around and there was a couple options of places that we wanted to possibly live. We really started enjoying the South and traveling throughout the South, like Charleston and, um, you know, some other places. And uh, we kept visiting Nashville and kept liking it more and more. And brought Gracie here because I went a, a couple times before I was there for a conference or two and really got to see it and really started enjoying it. And then Gracie started visiting. She really loved it and kind of just all decided that this was the spot to come mm -hmm. so where was it between were you picking between like three cities that you wanted to go no i mean there i think there was uh there's charleston definitely we really fell in love with charleston and we still really love it there um fantastic food city such sweet people just unbelievable we, we vacation there as much as we can <laughs> now that we're on this side um but i think it was kind of between there uh we talked about possibly going to like back home to Gracie's area in Houston or Austin, somewhere there. Kind of like the, the, the main decision between everyone right now. Yeah. <laughs> California. So we're not very original. But you know what? Once we saw the caliber of food in Nashville and we saw how great the community was and the restaurant community, we really just fell in love very quickly. And we just liked it here. And we've never looked back. We absolutely love it here. We, was there... Was there a seminal dining experience that you had when you came to like visit Nashville that you were like, wow, this is, you said that the dining scene was fantastic here. Right. Where do you guys like to eat? Is there a place that's just like your number one? Well, we always try to, well, we would love to repeat, but we always try to like try different things all the yeah. time. Um, uh, one of my favorites is Henrietta Red. I love how, um, vegetable forward, everything is okay. And same thing as Hawthorne, yes. So, good. yeah, Chef Evans killing it, yes. Um, I, I'd say, um, one of the things that was a draw when we got here was eating at both uh, Rolf and Daughters and Full mm -hmm. because those two restaurants, literally just dining in them and seeing, you know, from an insider industry perspective, right? The wine and the wine and beverage programs, the food, um the steps of service, everything. You literally take both of those restaurants, pick them up, put them out down in New York, LA, San Francisco, and they fit in. They're in the top, you know, they're in the top caliber of restaurants. Just everything about it is a top-notch dining experience. I think for me, that was what, you know, we, we ate at those two and we're like, wow, like yeah. this is, this reminds us back up from back at home a little bit. But, you know, like we ate at Ashton last night. It was incredible. Yeah. Like, was it your first time? First time, yeah. Was it, you tell me you're just blown away, right? Yeah, it was just every little piece of it so well thought out, so delicious. Textures, flavors, service, um, the engagement with the staff. Josh is amazing. Lauren's amazing. Um, Alex with his wine parents amazing. Um, so yeah, those are those are you know some of the dining experience we've had. Capper seat was amazing just to see that you know we could see another like high end tasty menu, which we don't like to do too much anymore yeah. these days. Um, but that was an amazing experience. So like some of those really hit home to be like, this is such a high caliber city. Plus, I mean, I think what gets us the most excited is seeing folks like Julio at Mize mm -hmm. and, and Edgar at Alabrije and Michael at St. Vito, the, the, the way people are pushing right now and grinding. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It gives you so much energy. It gives you so much energy. Those folks are just on it and it's just, it's just mind blowing. I think that's what's so cool here. I think that's happening back at home, but it's just so much larger that 
you know, you kind of lose track of those things. And that's why I like it's a little more tight knit here and a little just a bit smaller geography to kind yeah. of keep track of. And So it's interesting because if San Francisco is, is, to use the analogy, it is a big pond. Yeah. And there's a lot of fish in that pond. And Nashville is a smaller pond, but it doesn't mean that the pedigree of fish are any different, so to speak. Right. It's amazing chefs here. How do, It seems like you guys have been welcomed into the community really, really well. In your perception, how do you feel like the city of Nashville, as as far as a culinary community, has welcomed you into the community? I mean, amazingly yeah. well. We're we're still in awe of it every day, and we don't believe that we should be received this well. Honestly, <laughs> like just super humbled, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's been amazing. Everyone has just been the outpouring has been great. I mean, we even go back to our first pop up, one of our first pop ups at Jackal up the ranch. You know, Josh came out of Bashing and just walked across the street and said hello. I mean, yeah, like you know, just. And he was like a celebrity to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like you just, like that might happen in San Francisco, but it just seems like it would be not that much of a story or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just, and there's, there, you know, the San Francisco community is great. Um, you know, for a while, a lot of the chefs were hanging out, doing things. There used to be this great, like, Fourth of July picnic where everyone, all these different chefs brought food and hung out together. It was like once a year where that happened. That was really cool. I think times have changed a little bit though but here yeah it's I, I just can't believe how welcomed we've been and you know our it, it feels really good because of course we want to have a sustainable business where um, we're successful and and everything's working and we can retain staff and grow and hire more people and and all that that's like the biggest goal but to have the appreciation and the love of your peers really kind of hits home and makes you feel good quite honestly you know yeah no, it's, it's cool to see because I mean, I've, I watch your feed and I've brought a handful of chefs in to see you, but like, I, I feel like everywhere I see anybody that comes in, just a testament to this, this project you just did with the Nashville food project. I mean, the chefs that made a Bon Mi sandwich to add to that, I mean, was really, I have second to none. I mean, those people that just came out to support you guys was absolutely, and the food was was amazing. Um, how much money did you guys end up raising for the Nashville Food Project? Yeah, over five thousand dollars. So, wow. pretty amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of sandwiches. Um, that is a lot of sandwiches. Yeah, it was over a lot. A... And you know, the folks that we kind of reached out to do that with were some of our biggest and best supporters when mm -hmm. we came to town. That was kind of was a little bit based off of. Um, and yeah, we couldn't have been happier and more proud mm -hmm. of of how it all went. It was very tough. <laughs> There's still some tough moments where we almost broke um, <laughs> a few yeah. times, but I think uh, it was just such a great project for so many reasons and um, so happy we did it and so happy we were able to engage with the community, the Nashville Food Project and the other chefs. Just so when you say you almost broke, what, can you give me an example of like, what do you mean? Was it like product didn't come in or you had too many people. Like, what do you mean you almost broke? Give us an example. Well, it started off with a fried elbow bun me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Brian Lee Weaver sandwich oh was crazy. Um, yeah, we got crushed on that one. Um, fried avo? Yeah, it was, it was, it was Brian Lee Weaver's uh, whipped feta uh, fried avo and his dream weaver hot sauce. Um, you talk about like a brand following or, or why it's important to kind of uh, create something around um, one of your big brand standards or, or, you know, your, your best sellers. Wow. He did a great job because yeah, that, that was the first series where we stepped back and we're like, we are so busy. We yeah. can't even handle this. Well, we this had to is, take a break. We had to shut down. Yeah. On, on a few <laughs> occasions. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, and then Sean's sandwich also, as you can oh imagine, was 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 nuts. There were some days where we didn't know if we were going to make it through the whole thing, and staff was looking at us like, "What are we doing?" Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, "It's so good, it's for charity. Come on!" And they're like, "Yeah, you can do it." <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're if, if anyone's seen, they all know we have a tiny kitchen. Um, so it doesn't matter how good of restaurateurs you are, how experienced you are, you still only have so much. Uh, space to work with and uh, we're definitely kind of at capacity and and during those times we were at really at capacity um, 
and uh, yeah, it was it was it was nuts. It was a lot of fun, but it was it was crazy. Do you guys have like a secret word, like a safe word, like <laughs> like my wife and I? We steal from the movie Four Christmases, mistletoe. He's like, what's it? He's like, he's like laying there. He falls off. He's like, mistletoe, mistletoe. Like my wife and I, when we like get into like a fight and it's a stupid fight, I'll call, I call mistletoe and I'm like, all right, mistletoe. Like we've, we got to stop, take a step back. Like, what are we even arguing? About? I was like, it's stupid. It's nothing. Like that's our word. Do you guys have a word in the kitchen where like, if it starts going down and she looks at you and you're like, it's about to, she's like, okay, bond me squared or some like, you know, is there something that you guys do together? Like, what is that? Well, I think when, um, if it gets there, if there's a little tension in the kitchen or something, or Chad is like, we would always say like, watch your tone. Yeah. And that would like shut us down a little bit. But I think you're right. I think we do need like a nice one yeah. word keyword that just Gracie and I know, because yeah, it does get a little, it's a little nuts in there. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, being married too, we, we know how to push each other's buttons at the same time a little bit. So, um, the thing. You know, we try we try to keep it cool in front of the kids. We do have an open kitchen. Um, there's been some tense and stressful moments for sure. Um, but uh, you know, we all, we all should, we create, should we create the word right now? <laughs> I think we should come up with the word, and then if people hear that word, they know like okay. <laughs> <laughs> like a special uh, like you guys should yeah. Are, well, I, I'm you guys can think of that on your own. I have all these ideas for you now. Okay. Like, in and out has like animal style, right? If you had right. like some sort of like a super secret bun me style that was like double vegetable and double meat, and be like, I want it Westminster right. style or something, you know, Ooh. that was like, what? What is that? People are like, oh, I, I'm in the know. I know what's up. So let's talk about what a bun me is because I'm sure people are listening to this and like, oh, these people seem really nice and I like them, but. What the hell? Is, they've already Googled what a bond me is if they haven't, um, which I also am looking at your hat. When I wear my hat, it's my favorite thing. And people go, where's where's uh, where's Bond, Michigan? Yeah, that's like, right. I actually get people that's to right. ask me that, like, where's Bond, Michigan? Because I wear that hat all the time. And it says East Side Bond and then the MI. Right, that's so oh. <laughs> and people go, where's Bond, Michigan? Are you from Michigan? Like the East Side of Bond, Michigan. I'm like... <laughs> Pretty specific. No, it's a sandwich. It's a place in East Nashville. It's great. Um, let's talk about what what is what makes a classic bun me, Gracie. Um, so I, I feel like what we build in a sandwich is very classic. Um, so it starts off with a baguette, um, like a lighter, crispier baguette, and then so we uh, slather it with butter mayo, which is not exactly like mayonnaise, but it's just really eggs and oil. But we actually use the leftover oil from frying shallots and use that oil for more flavor and then throw in more shallots on top of that and mix everything up. So we give a good amount of it. And then um, the traditional garnishes is like the cucumber, the pickled vegetables, which is uh, carrots and daikon. And it's not like, like a sour pickle, it's more like quick pickling, sweeter. The fresh cilantro and um, give it a little bit of um, jalapenos to spice it up a little bit, and then um, and then of course the meat of your choice. Um, but to finish off, you have to have the Maggie and the black pepper. The what and the black pepper? We call it Maggie, which is like a seasoning soy. It's not really soy sauce. Um, okay. Um, but it's like a seasoning soy. I'm sure, like they use it in Europe. It's just like a. It's like a mommy kick to it. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it's it's a sandwich, mm -hmm. but it is not your average sandwich. And this bread is made from heaven, right? I mean, <laughs> this bread is unbelievable. And who makes all the bread? Yeah, we make we make the bread in house. Um, we make it from scratch. I mean, it's. I mean, why not? You know. Yeah, and how I long? I can't even find the bun me bread if I wanted to in Nashville. But your kitchen is tiny, like, and you go through. I mean, how many sandwiches are you guys making every day now? Uh, we probably bake about from three hundred to three fifty but breads a day, because um, we we try to not run out. 
there are days when we will, but we try and not to run out of bread. And it's okay if we had a few extra 20 left. It's so stressful when you're like counting down. Mm -hmm. And so I'd rather just have extra bread yeah. and just, you know, get away next door or to the staff, take it home, make garlic bread, you know, do whatever they want. With it. Do you never use the bread from the previous day the next day? No. And Every, I mean, are you tempted? I mean, like, cause you got to look at, there's all these costs and everything that goes on. And then, I mean, I, I understand the integrity of what you're doing, but like at the end of the day, there's gotta be that, well, we'll just use it tomorrow. Like that's, that is not a thing. No, no. I don't know. I believe in karma. I feel like something bad will happen. <laughs> if I did, yeah, I feel guilty. <laughs> well, I think there's, you know, and, and the other thing is that we're often baking bread throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get fresh bread throughout the day. Like, it's not like, oh, nine o'clock, we're baking off every single piece of bread for the day. No, it's, it can't work that way. You know, we start baking off what around nine, 10, mm -hmm. and it continues throughout the day. So, a lot of time people are getting, or most of the time, people are getting super fresh baked bread. We do retoast a little bit because you want that really crispy exterior and soft, pillowy interior. And that's what classic on me is or should be. Um, but yeah, the bread is, the bread is major. It's just like a, you know, the Italians with pasta and pizza, they'll tell you that it's all about that dough. It's all about the pasta mm -hmm. first. That's the most important thing. And then whatever you add to it is fantastic and it makes the final dish, but it really should be about that base vehicle, if you will. So what is the most popular? If, if Oh, I'm gonna rephrase that because the most popular is not the best usually. What is, if I'm going there for the first time, I'm listening to this and I go, wow, there is a place in East Nashville that is making banh mi. I didn't know what a banh mi was, but now I know that you're making a baguette every single day. Throughout the day, this is a fresh bread that has got a kind of crispy outside, pillowy inside. I love the way you said that. It has a pillowy inside. You're putting um, all kinds of, there, there's a carrot and you said, is it daikon on all of them? Is it daikon or is it cucumber? Uh, daikon radish with the carrots. Daikon, carish, carrots, cilantro, jalapenos, and, jalapenos, and that. So on this bread, inside of the sandwich, it, and it's crisp. There's like this crispiness. Then they add the meat. What is the one that you've you the best one that you make in your opinion that you have to try? I need to try this. Right. So when somebody says it's their first time, we always tell them they have to get the pork, the pork with the pate. Okay. Yeah. Isn't and they, uh, it's a black is it just pork. called the pork with pate or is there a name for it? Like, uh, like I think it's the, yeah, we say the pork sandwich, but it's a, it's slow roasted for three hours um, in the oven with the caramel sauce that has like lemongrass and garlic and onions fish sauce, and fish sauce for three hours. And it's just nice and tender and delicious. The there's one that you have that's like the meat. Is there like a meat one that's like steak and pate and what's that? What's, I forget what the one's called. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the chopped steak. The chopped steak. Right. Yeah. I ate the chopped steak the first time I came in, and I remember eating the sandwich because you weren't, the dining room wasn't open when we were, it was the first week, and the dining room wasn't open. My wife and I were sitting in the car outside in your parking right. lot, yeah. and I'm not kidding. I've got this sandwich in my lap, hmm. and I'm halfway through the sandwich, and I look at it, and I go, this is, this is a flavor. This is it. And I was like, <laughs> There's a flavor happening in my mouth right now that I like, I dream about. That's that perfect, that crispness of biting into the sandwich and getting the carrots and the pickles and those jalapenos, that, that perfect level of spice and the perfect meats. Like, and I looked at it and I was like, I almost had tears in my eyes. I was like, this is the flavor. Like I search for all the time. They did it. They found it. It's right here. <laughs> That's a pretty exciting moment when you get to have that. Do you get a lot of feedback like that? Um, I think well, I, I, most people really love it. Yeah, um, like I, I don't want to say that. Yes, but <laughs> yeah, but I think I think what's happening is that um, people are truly seeing what this cuisine is all about. You know, because Vietnamese cuisine is all about all these kind of different flavors, how they come together and balance each other. You got sweet, salty, um, you know, the herbaceous. You mm -hmm. have the spicy. You have all that and. The way it just comes together and balances is just unbelievable. And that's why the banh mi sandwich is such a great creation, right? Um, you have like the French kind of uh, bread and uh, mayo and the pate, and then you have the really cool grilled meats with the great Asian marinade and, you know, the pickles and the cilantro. And that's why the banh mi sandwich is one of the best sandwiches in the world. 
You know, it's it truly is. I, I'm gonna tell you this, and I'm not kidding. That is the best. Like your sandwiches are the best sandwiches I've ever had in my life. Like oh. I'm not I'm not kidding. And my grandmother, <laughs> anybody that's made me a sandwich, I'm telling you, the multiple banh mi's that I have had in your establishment are the best. And I hear that from everybody. Thank and a lot of people think that you guys are like one trick ponies. They're like all you can do is make sandwiches. I'm reading on Eater Nashville last week, an article by my friend Delia Joe Ramsey. I think yep. she was the co-host the day that we did our show. Um, yeah. You guys are opening in at the Wash a new place called ESP. Yeah. Mm-hmm. East Side Pho. Yeah. It pho? It's pronounced Pho. Uh, mm-hmm. Pho. P-H-O, but it's pronounced Pho. Yeah. Well, how would you guys? Tell us what's going on there, guys. Give us the scoop. Um, so it's going to be a small, small shop and, um, hopefully this will be the last restaurant we open, <laughs> but, uh, it's going to be, no just, way in hell. <laughs> we just want to make Vietnamese soups, which I crave all the time. And, um, that's what it, oh, that's all it is. Just small menu, just a soup shop. Yeah. It's supposed to be just a little soup stall. And that's yeah. why. You know, would, would I say we were ready to open the second one or we wanted to? Probably not. But this was always the plan for the second. It was to be a somewhat of a, a complementary um, concept to uh, Eastside Bami. Mm-hmm. Whereas these days we really like to, instead of trying to do multi-unit of one brand, we really have a bunch of different ones that we have kind of in our pocket that we can open up in the future. Um, and instead of doing doing trying to do more east side bombies around town we're just really not into that game anymore there's nothing wrong with folks that do that but i just feel like once you start doing that you start losing some of the specialness to it Uh, you start diluting your brand just a little bit and again great strategy for those that do it and there's some fantastic multi-units around town but just from our perspective we wanted Mm -hmm. to kind of go in a new direction after scaling a a restaurant brand from one to ten units um so this was always kind of the plan for the second one. And we couldn't pass this one up. It's a block from um, a long a long block from Eastside Bon Me. So it's super close. Um, there's our good friend, Tyler Cobble from the Cobble Group, uh, who was putting this all together. And um, it was just a great opportunity that we couldn't pass up. And we always just wanted to do a little soup stall. Just really keep it simple, really based off of the soups, really great broths, um, really great products still sourced locally. And something that would be complimentary to Eastside Bon Me. Because with Eastside Bon Me, we really wanted to open up this, uh, a Vietnamese restaurant that wasn't the one of everything. We didn't want to have the whole classic, you know, I'm going to have every single classic Vietnamese item on there. That wasn't our goal. It was really to highlight Vietnamese sandwiches and then have a few other things so we can make sure we could cover everyone's appetites when they come in. Um, but this one is really about soups and noodles and, and all that. And it's going to be amazing. So you said that you crave, and I can't wait for that, by the way. I'm so excited about that. You said, Gracie said, sometimes I just crave a good Vietnamese pho or a good Vietnamese soup. Where do you currently go when you crave that? Where's the best in town before you guys get open? I'm sure when you guys get open, that's going to be the best in town. But if you're craving that before you guys open, where do you go? Um, so I, there was, so there's this one place. I think it's in Nolensville, but I'm not for sure. Um, but it's called Baker's Boss, and um, it's this cute little place. And this Vietnamese woman, she actually makes bunnies there, and she makes her own bread. And I went to check it out, and her soups are really good. It's kind of like what I remember eating them back in the day. I can't think of the name of the place. There's a place on Charlotte Pike, right across the street from K&S Market. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of little Vietnamese businesses over there and restaurants and stuff. Um, there's, I want to say it's like Viet Pho or something along those lines. I don't, I don't Vien, remember. Vien Pho, I think it is. Unbelievable. It's one of the better places I've ever had Pho. And it was fantastic. My brother loves to take me there. He's like, let's go eat over the, the place on Charlotte Pike. Nah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's go. I didn't know if you guys have eaten there before. I have not. We, we tried it once in the beginning. Oh, right, yeah. right. But not the Pho, though. Yeah. They're supposed to have a really good, I think it's a, a duck pho, I think. I think that Delia talks about a lot or, um, yeah. Uh, so we haven't tried that yet, uh, but we did try some food when we first got to town. Okay. I love it. Um, I was going to say, I, I want to take you guys there. We got to take you there and I want to hear your opinion. Tell me what to order because 
I, I'm just not good at that stuff. Um, and you think so? Because I mentioned Westminster earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did are you? Did you live down there? Or did your, your grandmother live there? We're talking about Southern California, uh, Orange County. There is right outside of Huntington Beach. Yeah. Uh, my my mom grew up in um, Garden Grove, right. and Fountain Valley, and yeah. Westminster is all right there. I went to Westminster High School my sophomore and junior year while I was there. Oh, okay. Um, so I went. I was a lion, the Westminster Lions. Played basketball before I started here and finished here in town when Centennial High School opened. I moved back, but I lived in Westminster, which is known as uh, Little Saigon. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I mean, my school was four to one Vietnamese to Caucasians. Right. Yeah. Right. I was. I literally my second day at school, the basketball coach walked in and goes, <laughs> "You're on the team. Going to be at practice today at two o'clock." And I was like, I, "I don't. No, I'm not." And he's like, "Yes, you are." And I was like, "I, I guess I'll be there at two o'clock. Thank you." You're the team captain. <laughs> yeah, it was like I, I was a giant, yeah. uh, but it was cool. I mean, I, I loved uh, being in that area. I mean, there's just a lot, a lot of opportunities for Vietnamese cuisine, and it's authentic, fantastic stuff. Did you live there? Did your grandma live there? How, where's the? Yeah, so my um, my dad, he actually still lives there okay. um, in Fountain Valley. Oh yeah, in Fountain Valley. But I always grew up. I was in Houston, but I always go like once or twice a year to go visit him. And of course, we'll just eat all over Little Saigon for sure. Yeah. He likes to take us all over there. Every time yeah. we visit, it's always he's got a new like cool place yeah. um, that he always wants to take us to. That's like totally Vietnamese, and and it's often different. There's this one like spring roll place where there's like a crunchy inside, and that was all the rage with the Vietnamese community for a little bit. Yeah. So he took us there. You know, he took us to a pub place he liked last time. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just great to go with him. He like drives us all throughout Little Saigon. You know how it is there. It's like thousands of, of Vietnamese businesses of all different kinds. It's crazy. All these little strip malls just full of stuff. And, you know, it's cool. Maybe about three or four years ago when we started really heavily researching uh, Bon Mi, we took a trip down there and we ate at so many different places in one day, just kept going and getting different sandwiches here and there. And and all that and that was that was really a lot of fun it's great research that's awesome it's just a small world sometimes you meet people and you're like yeah there's this little tiny little part in southern california in orange county and your dad lives there and you guys have been there and like, right. i grew up in that area that was like where my grandparents lived and the whole thing so yeah that's a cool connection that's awesome well guys we're we're what what am i what am i missing right now what do you guys want to talk about what's big on you on your minds um, you know, we're just super thankful to be here and just want to thank everyone for being so great to us and, and, and really supporting the business and everything we're doing. And we love Nashville and I think we found our home forever and yeah, just absolutely love it here and just super thankful for everything. And, you know, our goal is to continue just to try to be humble, put our heads down and cook mm -hmm. good food and be nice to people. And Generally, that's a that's a good equation to to have a nice uh, sustainable business. So that's kind of the goal. And uh, yeah, we just we absolutely love it here. And thank you for everything and for having us on and and all that. Wow. You guys are like two of my favorite people in this town. Just awesome. just the way you've come in, your humility, your energy, your enthusiasm. Your um, you're just such kind people. And you walk into your restaurant and it feels like hospitality. It feels like awesome. what it should feel like. And you know what I'm talking about? Like you're walking somewhere and the host just kind of looks at you and is like, what? And you're like, uh, yeah, what? Like we have two people like, oh, and they just grab me and start like, there's, yeah. you know, there's no emotion to it. There's no feeling. And I like when I walk in somewhere to feel like I'm being welcomed into like, my, I feel like, like I'm welcoming somebody to my home, you know, like welcome or yeah. somebody to be like, there's a real hospitality. And every time I'm around you guys, I feel that. So, I mean, even at Giffords the other day, you walk up and you're outside in a tent, but I still felt it. Like it's still, it's just part of who you guys are. And I absolutely love that. And I wish more people would just adopt that. And I think it comes from your heart. I don't think it's something that you like have written down that you need to do like this is something that just happens because it's who you are and i love that and i just wanted to share that with the the whole city of nashville if you haven't heard of east side bond me you've got to go check it out so you just now said kind of a little bit there where you said thank you nashville i always let you guys 
take us out. The, the guest gets to take us out of the interview. I'll, I'll defer to Gracie today. You guys can both jump in if you like, but um, take us out of this episode. Whatever you want to say, as long as you want to say it, you're speaking to the city. I'm giving you full screen. Go. Well, well I don't have much to say. But, uh, Chad, you should say something. No, just thank you, everyone, so much. Um, it's been fantastic, and we hope to bring uh, a lot more great food and great hospitality to Nashville for the for the for the future and uh just so excited to be here and thank you thank you brandon thank you restaurant community thank you to all of our guests and all the folks in east nashville and nashville overall we're just we love it here and um there's something special definitely happening here and we see it and we're hoping to be a part of it for the future so thank you crazy yeah yeah I'm you guys got it. Thank you so much for taking time. Yeah. I would say thank you so much for taking time on your day off. I know you guys don't have a ton of time, and this just means the world to me. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, Nashville.